welcome back to the Spectra Creative Channel with me, your host, Scott Toy Guru Nightlick. And if you couldn't tell by this blue skull faced guy on the throne, today we're talking about Skeletor. He's obviously known as a lot of things over the years. He's, you know, the overlord of evil, ruler of Eternia, space pirate, puppy dog lover. Well, okay, maybe he's not quite known as a puppy dog lover all the time, but he, you know, he does love space puppy dogs, and he, he's like, you know, like the, the pimp of evil, right? Well, however it is you like Skeletor, today we're going to talk about his origin, and that starts off with a mini-comic from the vintage era that was entitled The Search for Keldor. This was one of the final mini-comics. It came with Clamp Champ and Scare Glow and Ninjor, that kind of wave. And uh, it first introduced the concept of Keldor. And you might be saying, Keldor? Who's Keldor? Oh, by the way, notice that Penciler is uh, Bruce Tim on this one, as in that Bruce Tim. So Keldor is introduced in this comic as the long-lost, vanished brother of King Randor. And people just know him as the story of this uh, prince that disappeared a long time ago. Now Skeletor says they must never discover the secret of Keldor because that knowledge could destroy me. And that's about all we learn about Keldor in this mini-comic, is that if you learn the true knowledge of who Keldor is, it would destroy Skeletor. Now, it was later confirmed that the writers of this mini-comic, yes, did indeed mean for Skeletor to be Keldor. Hence, you know, Skeletor, Keldor, that's basically how they explained it. I mean, it was pretty obvious in their minds that the, the idea was the long-lost brother became Skeletor, and Randor battling Skeletor was, you know, battling his own brother. This idea was picked up in full by the 2000X series, the Mike Young production series, which came out in about 2000, 2001. So the seeds that were set in the vintage mini-comic really paid off in this mini-series, or not mini-series, excuse me, this cartoon series, this animated series, where Randor and Keldor are really uh, facing off against each other, Keldor being the blue guy and Randor being the Caucasian guy there. And during the battle they have in the very first episode, which is a flashback to them being younger, Keldor has a plan to take this vial of acid here and basically chuck it at his brother, at Randor, in his face. But Randor is able to deflect the vial, and it bounces back and hits Keldor. Now, they don't actually say that they're brothers yet at this point. We just know that they're battling for control of Eternia. Uh, so at this point, Keldor is hit by his own acid vial that he intended for Randor, and his face is more or less melting off into a giant pool of ooze. He goes to the Temple of Hordak, you can see some Hordak uh, face imagery there on the walls, and basically begs his mystic arts teacher, more or less, to help restore him. And Hordak does this with all sorts of fun, magical, magical moments. We don't really see what he does, we just see kind of like whirling energy in the 2000X series. And the next time we see Keldor, he has a floating skull for a face. So it's not that his face was melted off by the acid, it was damaged by the acid. The floating skull face is sort of what was replaced by the magic. And this was illustrated also by the uh, Birth of Skeletor Keldor action figure, the Four Horsemen did, and Mattel for San Diego Comic-Con, where Keldor came with multiple heads, so you could put sort of a half-burned-off face on Keldor, reenacting when the acid hits him. But again, it's not the acid that turned him into Skeletor, it was the magic of Hordak in healing him. Basically, in order to keep him alive, he had to give him a skull face. Otherwise, he would have died because most of his face was burned off by the acid. So, uh, you know, this toy actually, I think, kind of misled some people to thinking the acid is what turned him into Skeletor, but... The acid was the, was the damage. All right, so back to Hordak. So while only a little bit of his, his origin was really fleshed out in the 2000X series and by that action figure, and I love when action figures can tell stories. Uh, that's a perfect example of one doing that. We wanted to really, uh, I guess, flesh this out even more in the classics mini-comics, and issue four was The Secret Origin of Skeletor. Originally, this was 
actually pitched by me as a video game concept. Uh, we were talking heavily about developing a video game with the digital group. So I wrote out a three page kind of basic plot of how the video game would work and how it tied into uh, 2000X series. But instead it got rewritten as a mini comic. So it starts off with Keldor and Randor as brothers in arms fighting against King, King Marzo, Count Marzo in the Great Unrest. It's kind of like the Anakin Obi-Wan Clone Wars era, if you consider Skeletor He-Man sort of Star Wars, <laughs> I guess, New Hope. So Keldor in that yellow mask and Randor in the background with his Galactus helmet taken from the 2000X series design are battling against Count Marzo, who has thrown King Miro, who is Keldor and Randor's father, the rightful king, he's thrown into a portal into Despondos, and Keldor cannot save his beloved father. He tries. But they are able to get their revenge, and they turn Marzo into the old man, and that ends the great unrest. So now Keldor, as firstborn, is supposed to become the next king. But all the people start shouting out that, no, we can't have a Gar king. No, no, that will never, you know, put up with that. Which might make you ask, well, why don't the people like the Gar? Who are the Gar? Well, the Gar are the blue-skinned race that you see on Eternia. They show up every now and then as different characters, and Skeletor, Keldor obviously being one of the more prominent ones. Another character that is from the Gar race is actually Cyclone, which, again, you can tell based on his blue skin. And the fact that if you look at the map of Eternia, he is from a place called Onwat Gar. Get it? You know, Gar, because it's the home of the Gar, which is this little island that's all the way on the left side of the map, kind of uh, half buried in the ocean. And it gets visited in the 2000X cartoon. Now, Anwat Gar was a much, much bigger place in Preternia back in King Grayskull's time. And that was deliberate because it was showing how the Gar built that up. You see, they originally came to Eternia in a star cruiser when their planet was destroyed. So they're kind of visitors. They're not um, indigenous to Eternia. And part of the prejudice against them comes from misunderstandings in history, but you will also see a cloaked guy with red eyes there in a couple of these panels sort of egging on the crowd, saying, you know, never give the, you know, the crown to the queen, or you know, give it to the queen, don't trust a gar. He's really egging on this prejudice and hatred that sort of already exists against the gar people. So the next thing we know we see inside the palace, and Keldor is kneeling before Randor's mother. This is not his mother, this is Randor's mother. They're half-brothers. And Randor's mother lies dead on the floor with you know, Keldor kneeling over her, and Randor runs in and is like, Mother, what happened? And Keldor's like, I, I didn't mean to. I, it was an accident. So the next thing we see is the, the old man who was uh, egging on the crowd out there is sort of shaking off this spell. And this actually was a little confusing, and that's definitely my fault in the writing. What this was meant to be, and the reason he had those red eyes, is the hints are there. Basically, uh, Hordak, you see on the cover, is the one kind of pulling the strings. He's manipulating things like a giant chessboard, pulling Keldor away from the throne. So the idea was that Hordak was pulling the strings, and we later will meet Hordak in, in an all-red energy. So... That was meant to be the visual hint as to what was going on, since we're going to meet Hordak in a moment as Red Energy, and you see him on the cover, you know, manipulating things like a chessboard. The idea was he was possessing that random old man to egg on the crowd in order to get events to play out the way he wanted them, which was namely Keldor accidentally killing Randor's mother, or, you know, it's left a little ambiguous, maybe he either killed on purpose, maybe Hordak possessed him a little, maybe Hordak manipulated events a little bit. Either way, uh, she was murdered by Keldor's sword, and Keldor was then banished from Eternia, or from Eternos, from the uh, palace. So while he was the firstborn and he was meant to become king, now that he murdered the queen mother, he's banished with his uh, Dylinx pet Panthor there, you see at his side, that he raised from a cub. 
And the two of them go out and start wandering Eternia. He's no longer, you know, the royal prince. He's now an outcast. And one of the things he finds while wandering Eternia in search of a new purpose is the old temple of Hordak on the, in the Dark Hemisphere, which is kind of rotting away. It's been there for centuries. And so looking for a new purpose in life and always looking for, you know, now he kind of wants revenge a little bit because he was supposed to be king and he's now become an outcast. So he wanders into the temple, and he's able to activate the spirit of Hordak and communicate with Hordak, who is trapped in a different dimension at this time. He's in Despondos, which is a different dimension, but Hordak can project his uh, sort of energy self into the temple in order to communicate with Keldor. Now, this was all part of Hordak's plan. He, Hordak essentially led Keldor to the temple deliberately, uh, much as he was manipulating the events and egging on the crowd to, uh, you know, not to, you know, play out their prejudices against the Gar. So here, Hordak basically promises that if Keldor swears allegiance to him, he can bring him great power and help him with his revenge, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very classic motif, right? You know, Emperor, Darth Vader, the whole nine yards. And we did release this figure in the Classics line, doing an all-red, clear energy version of Hordak. It was actually our first quote-unquote chase figure, where people didn't know the figure was coming. And it worked out rather well. I mean, at least it surprised people. So then we get a, you know, essentially Hordak is training Keldor in the dark arts and in magic, and Keldor is becoming very powerful, and he's learning all these spells and learning how to manipulate magic. And he starts wearing Horde armor, which is what we see Skeletor wearing with the, with the purple boots and the cape. And... Hordak basically tells him that you're powerful, but you can only really be powerful if you get one of the magical objects that has come into contact with the Star Seed, which is a magical energy source in the center of Eternia. That's a whole video to itself. And a few of the different staves have done this, have come into contact with the Star Seed and essentially absorbed some of the Star Seed's essence and energy, giving these staves huge magical powers. And you can see Hero's staff and the Havoc staff and King Hiss's staff, the Sorceress's staff, Evil Lins, are all among the staves that have touched the Star Seed at one point or another. So Hordak instructs Keldor to find one of these staves, and the one he's going to go after is the Havoc staff, which is held in the old city of Zalacia, which uh, has now sort of crumbled into the desert. So in Zalacia, Zalacia, Zalacia. Keldor meets the Faceless One, who is the guardian of the Havoc Staff, and you know he, he knows all the magic. He's able to get the Havoc Staff to really light up with a lot of energy, something uh, Skeletor isn't even able to do, because you know, the, ha the Faceless One has been guarding it for centuries and knows all the secrets of the Havoc Staff. And so, of course, they have a magic-on-magic -magic fight, and uh, you know Keldor tries using the magic that he has been taught by Hordak to take out the Faceless One, and essentially, you know, claim the Havoc Staff for his own. But the Faceless One is way more powerful than Keldor. And again, you know, he knows all the secrets of Havoc Staff and basically, you know, blasts Keldor practically out of the temple. Uh, because Kel while Keldor has been trained by Hordak, he's not up to par with the Faceless One. But during the battle, I mean, Keldor is obviously very determined because he knows that without a magical staff, He'll only be a magical apprentice. He'll never really be a true, you know, wizard, a true, you know, master of dark magic unless he gets one of these staves that have been, uh, have some of the energy of the star seed in them. So during the battle with the Faceless One, Keldor kind of grabs the Faceless One from behind and, and gives him kind of this choking move and in doing so makes physical contact with him. This invokes a series of flashing images for the Faceless One where he sees the future that this this man, this boy attacking him, Keldor, is eventually going to marry his daughter, Evelyn, have a child, and then that child is going to grow up to be the new guardian of the Havoc Staff. So the Faceless One realizes that in order for these future events to happen, for his grandson, if you will, the one on the uh, right there, Skeleton, holding the Havoc Staff up in the air, that's Skeletor and Evelyn's grown-up son, he has to voluntarily give up the Havoc Staff to Keldor. 
because uh, the Guardian bloodline needs to continue, as he says. So he realizes that through Skeletor, through Keldor, um, his grandson will be born. So Kelator returns to the Temple of Hordak and basically is like, all right, now that I have the staff, I don't need you anymore, and blows up the temple because, you know, he's all full of himself and realizes, I got the staff, I'm all, you know, badass now. And you can see this panel here where he pulls the hood up and it's basically Skeletor without the skull face. Uh, you know, it's everything but the final transformation. He's, uh, he's pretty darn close. And this was all really deliberate. I remember when Axel and I were talking about this panel, we really wanted this to be like, you know, 95% Skeletor. He's like really close here. Um, he's just not quite, you know, fully Skeletor because he hasn't had the uh, battle damage to his face at this point. All right. So then Keldor uh, goes around Eternia and basically starts recruiting other thugs and other mercenaries to his cause. Some of them he pays off. You can see Triclops there with a uh, giant chest of money. Others he just kind of recruits to his side. He's shaking hands with Merman there. I love that. It just cracks me up. You know, Keldor, hi, Merman, I'm Keldor. Want to come fight for me? And then, you know, of course, other evil warriors he, you know, either frees from prison, like uh, Kronos here, who is the one who's going to become Trapjaw eventually, actually by Keldor's hand, if you read the Origin of Trapjaw comic book by uh, MV Creations, which is really cool, by the way. You should definitely check out that comic. But uh, this is how he kind of meets Kronos first, by breaking him out of prison. And now this basically brings us to where we started in the 2000X series, where Keldor and his forces are battling against Randor and his masters, which is the battle we saw in the first episode of 2000X. So we did this panel to specifically recall that moment in the show, to show where they blended. So again, so here you have Randor facing off against Keldor, and Keldor pulls out the acid vial, throws it at Randor to try to burn off Randor's face and, and or kill him, because, you know, again, Keldor is the rightful heir. He is the firstborn son, albeit by a different mother. But the vial, as we noted earlier, bounces back and hits Keldor in the face, burning his face and essentially almost killing him. Here you see the same thing in the comic that you saw in the show with the vial hitting Randor's shield and the acid bouncing off the shield into Keldor's face. So Keldor is basically mortally wounded at this point, and just like in the show, we see him go to the Temple of Hordak and basically beg Hordak, even though he's essentially betrayed Hordak earlier by just sort of uh, toppling part of his temple and saying, I don't need you. Well, now that he's mortally wounded, he sort of comes crawling back and is like, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I need you, heal me. And we see Hordak do this in the 2000X series. We see him healing Skeletor, or healing Keldor, and turning him into Skeletor with magic. And we wanted to really, uh, I guess, you know, expand this in the classics line to kind of deep dive into what happened. So what you see in the comic is this giant green blur with a face surrounding Keldor. Now what this is, is in order to save Keldor's life, what Hordak does is he merges Keldor with this extra-dimensional being who is called Demo Man. So you're probably wondering, well, who is Demo Man and what does he have to do with the origin of Skeletor? The answer is actually quite a lot. So Demo Man here, as we released him in the classics line, noting he's the evil spirit from Despondos. Again, Despondos being that dimension that Hordak is trapped in at this point in the story. So, you know, just think of it as he came across this evil spirit and, you know, let's say put him in a jar, you know, or, or encased him in something, hope, you know, waiting to use him at some point. So who is Demo Man? The quick version is the original concept art for Skeletor is what became Demo Man. And we wanted to very much tie this into Skeletor's origin. And that was where this idea came from, that Keldor was merged with him. This art came out at the same time as the art that became the character Vikor, also by Mark Taylor. And while Vikor became an early one of the He-Men who guarded the Sword of He, we didn't want to just make Demo Man the same thing. And the art for Skeletor obviously evolved from Demo Man. It became a little bit less 
I guess, you know, sort of monstrous and more demonic with a skull face until eventually Mark refined it into the Skeletor we all know and love by the time he had his third or fourth version and his, uh, you know, sketch, which is what the toy was based on. Noting that the Havoc staff actually had a spring-loaded feature in this version. But you could probably also say that Mark was influenced by the Captain Drake figure from Big Jim that was released just a few years earlier. You know, same thing, skull face with a purple hood. And a lot of ideas at Mattel do get reused and rehashed constantly. I saw that happen all the time, so it's no surprise that the previous Big Jim figure influenced Skeletor's design. So Demo Man, whose real name is Ukrezikul Misrax, uh, again, just, you know, a demon from Despondos that Hordak has in his arsenal. You know, he's probably been collecting all sorts of demons while stuck there. And he combines him with Keldor. Now, this doesn't mean that Keldor is controlled by Demo Man. The idea is that the Demo Man energy heals Keldor, giving him the skull face, but it also greatly enhances his power. So Demo Man isn't controlling Keldor at all. Just think of him as like, you know, like a plus five magic, if you will. You know, he, Skeletor, now that now he can live because he's not dying from the acid burn, but his face has been replaced by a floating skull. And the merger with Demo Man has now made him just much, much more powerful. He's, you know, he's still himself. He's still fully in control. He's still Keldor. He's just now more powerful and has a floating skull head. And, of course, this was kind of part of Hordak's plan all along, because as shown from the cover and what he was doing by manipulating events, he's been in control the whole time. He's been, you know, slowly moving his pieces around the board to get exactly what he wanted, which is release from Despondos, because he's been making Skeletor for the purpose of releasing him. Meanwhile, the good guys put up a giant wall of mystic wall energy to keep Keldor trapped, well now Skeletor, in the Dark Hemisphere, and hopefully we won't have to deal with him, and uh, hopefully everything is, you know, going to be good, because, you know, Skeletor is trapped in the Dark Hemisphere in Snake Mountain, and we, all, of course, know that eventually he breaks the Mystic Warrior, or the Mystic Wall, and that sort of starts the whole Skeletor versus He-Man series and battle, as shown in 2000X. And that is basically getting us to the point that we now have Skeletor versus He-Man. And that's how we get here. So that's the whole backstory. That is how Keldor goes from being the royal prince and heir to the throne, to being banished, to getting more power, to almost dying, and then becoming Skeletor, after he's combined with an extra-dimensional power energy. So whatever version of Skeletor you like best, and there's been many of them, I hope you enjoyed this look at his origin. It's, uh, it's an interesting story and in how he really is supposed to be the heir to Eternia. And in a lot of ways, that's what makes a good villain, one that's right. That's, uh, you know, he is in the right for wanting to rule Eternia. You know, it was his to rule. It was taken away from him. All right, if you like this video, please do subscribe and give it a like. It tells YouTube to share it with other people, and I appreciate that. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below and uh, I'll answer all of them. Thanks for watching.